We're in a pretty severe drought here in the Chihuahuan Desert. So for example, last summer I was on a river trip downstream of here in an area known as the Lower Canyons, and it was just amazing how much wildlife we saw at the river because there's nowhere else for them to go right now. Most of the water and vegetation is along the river corridor because we've had so little rain. At the same time as it's being the most endangered river in the United States, it's the fastest growing region of both the United States and Mexico. The border region is the fastest growing region of our two countries. And there's only one water supply and it's already allocated out. There is no room for growth. There's no more water, there's less water. And yet the growth is, is intense. It's very rare that there's enough water, for example, to uh, float through the canyons in the Big Bend because there's no longer a sufficient flow to even carry a canoe or a kayak, and that's a, that's a real tragedy. It's a 17-year-old tradition. It's a river celebration that takes place throughout the watershed on both sides of the river. What it is, it's traditionally held the third Saturday in October every year. And communities can do it. It's, it's meant to increase awareness um, about the river, uh, get people out, you know, physically out there closer to the river to understand it. Maybe there's a cleanup. Maybe there's some type of exhibit, there's a water conference, there's canoeing, kayaking, different types of events that take place. We received a grant from the EPA through the board, through its Border 2012 program, and what that was designed to do was to reignite this, this theme and this issue and idea of the Abel Rio throughout the whole watershed. We started brainstorming and we came up with water testing, then student water testing project, and then why not have them do it on one day? And so you get this snapshot of the river and its tributaries. And it's this very uh, unique field-based student project. Last year we had 60 student teams from the headwaters of Colorado all the way down to Port Isabel in the Gulf and along the Pecos River tributary. We would collect water samples from the headwater through the eight states of the two countries and uh, would collect those waters in a relay starting up there uh, near Creek, Colorado uh, and ending up down at the Gulf. We provided the kits uh, with the help of the Gulf of Mexico Foundation and went through the training with the teachers working with Project WET. So these teams, they went out that one day to sample water. We knew that we were involved in linking uh, the schools together. We were involved in linking the organizations together. We were involved in linking uh, the governmental entities together. Uh, so it was, it was like a, it was like a, a motion picture for us. These teens and their teachers, and I'm sure their parents and their schools, as they learned about this, they see how interconnected we are. Forrest? Yep. Good to see you. This is my friend John Nick. John, how's it going? So, uh, not right now. Is that Stony Pass? No. <laughs> Stony Pass is still ahead of us? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You won't even be to the top. And right there is where we'll be able to collect the water samples. Yeah, it was, it was a huge undertaking, but we did pull it off and we had the cooperation of virtually every organization and agency and governmental entity from Colorado all the way down on both sides of the, the border, on the Mexico side as well as the U.S. side. I'm going to take a picture of everything around us here. Forty degrees. It's cool. 
So they knew that these samples were, were, were going to have some, in, in, so, some significance, some importance. And that's why it was so important, because they all understood that, that, that their sample was going to be poured into the mouth of the Rio Grande. We got it from the headwaters. These are the samples from the headwaters. Um, I think it's important for people to know um, that a river provides all kinds of services, not only for fish and wildlife, but also for people. And that, you know, we can come here and enjoy it in a recreational way, but it's also providing water um, for anything you could possibly think of you might want to use water for that's used from this water in the river. I, I would say probably it was one of the first rivers really discovered even when Cortez was conquering the Aztecs, he had sent a ship up to explore the coast. So they were the first one to come in uh, contact with what they called the Rio de las Palmas. And really, from that point on, uh, it, it really became a Spanish and Hispanic river. The Rio Grande, um, really throughout the Rio Grande, but, but also here specifically in the Big Bend Reach, um, is a very different river than it used to be. When I think of the Rio Grande, I have this picture of the Wild West. You know, deserts and cowboys and, and uh, Indians uh, fighting and so forth uh, on the system. So I have this as a, as a kind of mental picture of the Rio Grande. To give you perspective of, of the basin itself, it's a huge watershed basin, the river itself, all of the tributaries that feed it. The basin covers more than 350,000 square miles in two countries. The Rio Grande flows from Colorado all the way through New Mexico into Texas and to the Gulf of Mexico. Certainly, for many reasons, a, a, a worldwide recognized river, uh, 24th longest. It uh, starts in a major mountain chain and goes into, a, goes into an ocean. But as you can see, it extends much further uh, uh, beyond on both sides of the river to include all the tributaries that feed it. Um, this part of this is the Pecos River, very large watershed basin that feeds us. Um, and it enters just upstream from Amistad Dam and Del Rio. And then this in Mexico, very, very crucial, important um, river system, the Rio Conchos. And um, the Rio Conchos enters is a main tributary to the Rio Grande entering just upstream here near Presidio, Texas, or Ojinaga in Mexico. We, uh, at, at the center, the, the idea of even getting one place that would be a center for studying the river came about when we were first declared an endangered river by the American uh, rivers, or the American heritage rivers. For the past two decades, the Rio Grande has been uh, one of the most endangered rivers on the world. It's the seventh most endangered river in the world is the most endangered river in the United States. It is imperative that young people become very aware of this and, and start thinking about this and start getting very familiar with the river itself and its tributaries because they're going to become the ones that inherit this river and its problems, its beauty too, but uh, you know, they're going to be the ones that try to get that river off the list and make it a much more uh, healthy river. Early part of this century, the Rio Grande did not reach the Gulf of Mexico. It stopped flowing. And, uh, and um, that was a stark you know, wake-up call because uh, we just couldn't imagine a river of that magnitude and scale actually not having enough water to reach the Gulf, but that actually happened within the last decade. There have been many studies on the Rio Grande, many models run and so forth, but the appropriate allocation of the water based on the hydrologic balance still doesn't exist. And this is going to be a problem until it's solved, and it has not been. At the same time, politically, it's become a, um, a, almost a no man's land again because of the immigration issues with Mexico, and I think that, that that'll end up being probably the biggest challenge we've ever faced is sort of sorting out 
how we deal with our neighbors uh, with the Rio Grande in between. I wish I could say there were more positive things about the, the Rio Bravo, but it's a, it's a river in distress, there's no doubt about it. There are too many people with too many straws flowing into the Rio Bravo for it to sustain over time. Here in the Chihuahuan Desert, the Rio Grande is really the lifeline of, of this area. It's the heart of um, almost three, I think actually now more than three million acres of protected areas on both sides of the border, so in Texas and in Mexico. And it's really evident right now because we're in a pretty severe drought here in the Chihuahuan Desert. It's cyclical, but also it remains to be seen how much climate change um, is having an impact on our weather cycles and right. weather patterns. So for example, last summer I was on a river trip downstream of here in an area known as the Lower Canyons, and it was just amazing how much wildlife we saw at the river because there's nowhere else for them to go right now. Most of the water and vegetation is along the river corridor because we've had so little rain. At the same time as it's being the most endangered river in the United States, it's the fastest growing region of both the United States and Mexico. The border region is the fastest growing region of our two countries. And there's only one water supply and it's already allocated out. There is no room for growth. There's no more water, there's less water. And yet the growth is, is intense. It's very rare that there's enough water, for example, to uh, float through the canyons in the Big Bend because there's no longer a sufficient flow to even carry a canoe or a kayak, and that's a that's a real tragedy. Rio Grande between Del Rio and Sierra Cunha. Got a little island in the middle. A little spillway down there. Well, it has an effect economically because of all the things we depend on, the, particularly the lower reaches of the river for with respect to irrigation, uh, municipal water and, and the like. It has a profound effect on recreation when it doesn't even have enough water to, to float a kayak or a canoe. Uh, but it also has a devastating effect on the aquatic ecosystems which are in the river. Without question, one, once again, one of the most interesting things about it is it's a river that has, you know, healthy populations of rainbow trout in Colorado, but it has redfish and, uh, and speckled trout in its lower reaches, so it has a tremendous uh, diversity of aquatic ecosystems. And plants uh, on a global scale use about 75% of all the water humans use. And we have big agricultural areas in the Rio Grande Basin, so we have a large so-called consumptive water use. We can't use it again until nature brings it back to us in the form of clouds and rain, where we use it in our house and our factories and so forth. We can use it again and again as long as we clean it. Uh, more than anything else, it's because of its, both its natural diversity and its uh, strong cultural heritage. It has a, a very rich combination of both. We have, you know, probably just on, on the Texas border itself, somewhere between five and six million people, uh, maybe nine to ten million, really share the water of the watershed. The water is heavily managed, which makes a big difference for how much water actually reaches the river. Water is being used by people for municipal uses as well as agriculture. And so there's, there's less left for the river itself and for the fish and wildlife that depend on the river. What happens upstream directly affects people downstream. And so we've had changes in what species uh, exist here. We've lost some species. Um, and some of the ones that are still here, some of the native species, um, are definitely sort of barely hanging on. Among the greatest challenges facing the river is water availability and this issue of water scarcity, right? Much of this is driven by many of these dams that have been built, um, population growth, climate change, these drought cycles. And so what we need to do here is to really um, create more awareness and let people know what they can do as individuals 
or with their families and then we as a city what can we do to conserve more water and to not be so wasteful with our consumption of it? It's an iconic river system also because it's a major international boundary between two countries in North America. Uh, and it's, it's an important river in that context because in this particular part of the world, it's basically the only major source of water for a surprisingly large number of people that live along the border. And that's uh, even more today than ever before is of great concern, you know, uh, a lot more issues than just uh, diversity and biology and geology anymore. It's, uh, it's a real security issue. That's a pretty big challenge is how to continue to meet people's needs but also uh, provide what's needed for the ecosystem. So we're trying, um, working with the National Park Service, with Texas Parks and Wildlife Departments, with various agencies in Mexico now, um, to see how we can work together in a synergistic way, how each agency and, and organization can fulfill a particular niche so that we can uh, do our jobs as well as we can for conservation. We're now partnering with more and more agencies in Mexico. We have a pretty big initiative going right now to reach out to organizations and various agencies in Mexico to um, join us in our conservation efforts here on the river. In working on managing a river, it is so important to have have many partners at the table. So we've really been working on strengthening relationships between different conservation organizations, whether they be nonprofits or agencies, both in the US and Mexico, because no one entity can do this by themselves. It takes, you know, it takes a whole lot of people um, with very specialized uh, interests. Um, it, takes the, it takes just citizens, it takes stakeholders, um, who are interested in the river or live along the river or use the river either recreationally or use the water out of the river. It takes all of these people coming together to really make a difference and to conserve this river that's been so altered. You know, we have a lot of hope right now because there's a lot of momentum in bringing people together to do just that. And so it's an exciting time uh, to be here, to be working on this. Uh, so it's, it's important to create an awareness. All these different students going all the way up to the headwaters in Cree, these high school students, the grade school students, they would be sampling the water, they would be testing the water, they would be taking uh, and evaluating the, the chemical content of the water and the turbidity. <laughs> Perhaps 60 schools up and down the Rio Grande from Colorado to Mexico have been um, sampling starting about 11 a.m. this morning. And if they run all the tests at the same time, I mean in the same way, then uh, it gives us a really unique snapshot. Um, and the way that's different is that a lot of places go out on a regular basis every couple of weeks or whatever and sample the water, but that's um, the same procedures done in the same place over time. This is a lot of sampling done in different places at the same time, and that's what makes it unique. To interact with them and, and get them to realize that out of those students, would come the future custodians and stewards of the Rio Grande, the next generation. And that was our hope. Our hope was to nurture the concept that they needed to replace us. Laura? Yes, I'm, I'm Jay. There are schools like yours in all these states that yesterday uh, did this water sampling and water, began the water testing. That has never been done the same day, same hour, in any watershed on the planet. Everything you love about this river, we hope that some of you, not all of you, we don't expect all of you, but some of you, maybe one of you or two of you, will take it upon yourselves to do what we're doing in, in future years. The river needs stewards, needs custodians, needs people 
studying sustainable development and you know how to protect our resources we're looking at natural resources so this was a great study to just like fall into that realm of things so this was uh, we had looked at testing waters and so this was a great opportunity for them to actually take a real life situation and turn it into a, a learning opportunity so we ran the parameters except for we've got to collect still on Monday the coliform test uh -huh. But I was actually very amazed at how clean the river actually is at this point. So I was really thrilled to see to see that data. My name is Joel Sanchez. Uh, I am a, a teacher here at Santa Maria High School, and this year I have a group of students uh, in my environmental systems class. Okay. Very cool. And then you can give me the blue bag, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Is it in here? Yes. Oh, watershed, oh, watershed. What happened to our watershed? Danica. And this is the message from our team. Keep it clean, don't be mean, keep the watershed in your head. Got all of our samples in here. And you're going to officially give that to us? We are officially giving it to the Rio Vila team. Thank you guys so much. The, we all got in the river. We're all standing there in our in the river and picking it up. And so oh, they're... really good. Wow. Truth the consequences. Las Cruces this morning. This wow. is the first we're back in Texas now. <laughs> one river, many people, one world. That's cool. Well, thanks for stopping by. Thank you. Yeah. Ramon, thanks for sharing with us. I see. <laughs> uh, from uh, Del Rio High? Yes. And you are again? The science curriculum coordinator for the district. Look at the clarity there. Here at Portis Hill Junior High School, we collected our water sample on the South Padre Island. He's on Malcolm Park at the gym. educational uh, systems on the Mexico side, it was a bit more challenging because we couldn't really go into, the, into Mexico and go to the schools. What we did was we arranged for the schools to meet us at the international boundary. 
at the bridge. I'm going to try to catch you up to date on what we're doing. Uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce Patricia Cortez, who's the coordinator of DNL Wheel. Uh, John Metz here with the, the video camera. He has been traveling with me uh, from the very headwaters of the Rio Grande. So every bridge that we that we traversed, we would have the schools and their teachers and some of their elected officials meet us, as well as the media, at the international boundary line right over the Rio Grande Rio Bravo. And then finally, I think the probably the biggest challenge is to try to figure out a way to, because the river is international in nature, to manage its watersheds collectively between the two nations. And we haven't, although we've made tremendous strides in that regard, we're still not uh, we're still not where we need to be because uh, the, uh, the the hydrologically. Uh, the border has no meaning. It's all part of the same watershed, and we need to manage it that way. We've observed within the last decade the river not reaching the Gulf of Mexico, and so protecting the in-stream flows uh, in the river is, a, is probably the biggest hydrologic or natural challenge we have. So it was, it, was a, it was a great project to see the human element, the geological element, the hydrological element, uh, the fauna and the flora, and how it all changes according to the uh, to the geography. I'd like to see a river whose issues are more adequately addressed by the two nations on both sides. I think that probably the most a uh, challenging thing that we've that we've had to deal with over the last 10 to 15 years is getting the institutions on both sides of the river whether they be government agencies, nonprofits, municipalities to work together to 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 manage the river appropriately for the future and uh, and I, and my dream is that that would occur. And out of those uh, thousands of students and out of those uh, hundreds of uh, uh, organizations or participants of those organizations, we were able to pull together a, a regional image. If you look at our logo for uh, the Rio Relay and Dia del Rio, we highlighted the watershed of the Rio Grande, and, and it's it, the watershed of the Rio Grande has nothing to do with political boundaries. It's a geological watershed. And we need to be custodians of the entire thing if we are to protect that Rio Grande for the future. Rio Grande, Rio Bravo.